Nous allons maintenant ouvrir euh, dans cet acte 3 une réflexion sur les nouveaux business models. Act 3, let's talk about new positive business models with two CEOs. So we'll talk about uh, how we can combine positive governance and liberalism. We'll talk about those companies who have uh, included public good in their business model. Please welcome Alex Turkeltob from Rogue Analytics. And this discussion will be chaired by Arno Muro from HEK Global. Uh, the second speaker will be Dennis Metzger, chairman and CEO of Checkers Capital. Thank you, Arno. Over to you. Thank you so much. We have a complex challenge, i.e. we have 10 minutes to talk about future business models. So I'm very happy I'm sitting with representatives from the world of business, from um, North America for Alex and from Europe for Dennis. Uh, we won't be able to uh, spend too much time on this topic, so we'll try and be as simple as possible. Maybe we'll be a bit simplistic. Please uh, uh, accept our apology for that. But we will try and see how we can reconcile social and business social matters and business. And depending on where you live in the world, either you're schizophrenic, you create a, uh, value on the one hand, and then you become a philanthropist if you succeed. Or can we reconcile value generation and value for society? Can we monetize social impact in the future? This is what we need to talk about today. And the definition we chose for these new positive business models are the business models that combine economic value creation and societal value creation. Very quickly, Alex, you come from North America. Can you tell us in a few words who you, who you are and tell us what would be a positive business model for you? Alex, you were telling me that in the U.S. things are quite different because if you're a startup in the U.S., you must have a mission statement. You need to have a project and you need to address a major societal issue. Thank you very much for having me. I apologize. I'll have to speak English, although I assume most of the audience speaks English. Um, but I'll give time for the translation as well. Um, my name is Alex Turkeltab. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Rome, which is an artificial intelligence platform focused on the healthcare sector. We're based in San Francisco, and the technology and the company came out of Stanford University. Uh, in the interest of time, without spending a lot of time on what we do to answer your question, I think there, there's two parts to it. If you look at Silicon Valley, and here I'm not talking about American corporations, but more American startups, the reality is that the only way a company focused on enterprise clients can raise money is if the company is attacking some major social dysfunction that exists in the American and ultimately the global economy. So if you look at companies that get disproportionate amounts of funding, it's companies attacking various aspects of healthcare like we are. Companies focusing on education, companies focusing on energy, focusing in the broadly in the big data factor, focusing on, on workplace efficiency and results. And the reason that is, I think, is twofold is one, if you look at how the venture community thinks, at least in America, is their perspective is it's just as hard to build a small business as it is to build a large business. And so if we're gonna take an enormous amount of risk and write an enormous check for someone who has a one in a hundred chance of being successful, we wanna make sure that if that success does happen, it's extraordinary. But the other part, and this we actually didn't get a chance to chat about is, if you want to attract engineers, which is probably the hardest challenge and becoming harder by the day with the new American administration, you have to have some sort of way to distinguish yourself from among the 10 other companies that are giving him an offer, including the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. And so it's extraordinarily important to say, we are going to transform this bit of healthcare. And although I understand that oftentimes Americans sound pretentious, pompous, or childish, where every single company they start is the single most important company in the world, but it is an important part of how the, the culture of Silicon Valley works. And are you asked to report on the impact that you create to your investors? So no, the honest answer is no. I think it's always in the context of 
the opportunity for us only exists, the opportunity to become large and justify the investment, if we are able to transform this part of the economy. And if you look at our pitch when we first raised money, it was literally saying, we spend four and a half trillion dollars as the United States of America on healthcare. The vast majority of that money is spent badly and our outcomes are poor. In order for Rome to be successful, this, this, and this would have to change and the money would have to flow differently. And I think the one thing that American venture capitalists are particularly good at, which is, uh, again, I don't know the European scene that well, but I think it is quite different, is they're willing to write a big check based on a PowerPoint when you have almost no traction and essentially no revenue. And the reason they're able to do that is they understand that if they don't give you that money up front, it's virtually impossible to survive long enough to be able to deal with a large challenge like healthcare. Denis, en, en, en Europe et en France, les, cho les choses semblent relativement euh, différentes. Denis, in Europe, in France, things are a bit different. What's your experience of this uh, uh, field of finance and investment, which you're familiar with? We are almost schizophrenic, aren't we? We talk about business first, and what we do on the side is our personal matter. Yes, I've been trying to reconcile these two words for 40 years. I want to reconcile productive economy and social action. And I must confess that I've had a schizophrenic life, and I never managed to reconcile both. I wasted 40 years of my life. I just heard that I should have gone, gone to Palo Alto, and then I could have achieved the symbiosis between these two worlds. Well, the French are incredibly generous individually. They give a lot. The government is extremely generous in its tax policy for donations. We are very generous as a country, and donations are tax deductibles. But companies are very egocentric, almost autistic. And in the world of corporation, it's very difficult to reconcile a social impact. Uh, corporate social responsibility is now very much on the agenda, so things are changing a bit. There are beautiful examples in large corporations that uh, manage to implement corporate social responsibility outside the communication department. That's a big achievement, but it's also true that there is a disconnect between societal responsibility and the accountability of a manager. That's because of the law. The social purpose of our corporation defines a certain number of things, and the interpretation of the um, social purpose of a company defines a certain number of things. For instance, on board of managers, you hear people say, well, we're a company manufacturing screws and bolts, and it's not part of our uh, mission statement to fund a well in Africa. And board of managers now have a very quantitative vision of things. They want sales to increase. They want to have fewer uh, accidents in the workplace, and they're not in symbiosis with the world. And the second reason, uh, in my mind, is that the company environment is very hostile, uh, is faced with a lot of hostility. They face hostility from politicians, from church, from the press, from their employees, from public authorities, and everybody considers that when an entrepreneur is successful, he certainly has things to hide. And this constant hostility pushes entrepreneurs to stay in their fortress. So the question we need to ask is, what are the solutions? And how can we help entrepreneurs walk out of their fortress and no longer have two parallel economies, but just one positive economy. So what we're seeing emerging with carbon finance, which uh, monetizes and, uh, carbon, 
Can we think that this type of approach will eventually create an incentive so that in healthcare, education, or other fields, we go beyond just creating economic value and talking about the bottom line, but talking about monetizing externalities? Is this something we can think about? That's a very good idea, but it's quite difficult to implement because, but it's a very good idea because companies, entrepreneurs like quantifying things. They like to understand the impact of measures they make, they take, but the difficulty is to quantify things. So this might create an environment in which the smartest, not necessarily the most honest people, but the smartest will have an edge, and it will be difficult to monetize these externalities. Alex, when we talk about health care, externalities can be calculated, quantified, and that's probably why you attract investors. One recommendation for the working group that's going to work for six months. What are the opportunities that need to be explored to make sure that in the future we can realign these two types of value creation? Again, I think as you think about big companies that are trying to take opportunities of economic opportunities at the same time have a social impact. You have a lot of the same problems in America that you have here, which is that American companies all have corporate social responsibility. They all have big reports. As we were talking beforehand, 90% of it is window dressing. And although you cannot in a corporate board meeting in America not discuss it, the way you can't discuss it here, you, the actual impact of that stuff is primarily around attracting employees and checking a box. When you look at smaller companies, by definition, the only place you could be successful as a small company is a place a big company won't touch. And that could be for a variety of different reasons. One reason may be that there's a technological impediment, something new has to be invented. One may be that they benefit from the situation as it is and they're afraid to challenge something. One may be that a big company isn't creative enough to take on a regulatory issue. And I'll give you one very simple example. If you think about Uber, which has been in the papers the past couple of days, obviously with a new CEO coming on, and for all the problems they've had, they demonstrated enormous courage taking on regulatory agencies from city to city and company to company, which you may say that's not really about corporate social responsibility and that's fair, but it's an, it is an example of a startup that was well-funded, that had huge regulatory issues, and that decided that its mission about transportation would require it to take on those vested interests. I think in America, we tend to glorify that type of entrepreneur. I don't know the European scene as well, but it doesn't seem to be that way. And the other thing I keep coming back to this, I think it's an important point is that Uber, us, a number of other companies have been very fortunate to be extraordinarily well-funded. That gives you the opportunity to stick around to get through the problems. If you receive two million, three million, five million in seed funding, you don't have the time to figure out how you're gonna make a social impact on an energy issue or healthcare issue or other. And I think that's hugely important. Denis, même question sur ce sur quoi il faut qu'on bosse sur les six prochains mois. Denis, same question to you. What should we need to work on? I'm quite confident there are solutions ahead. We won't be able to change the way trade unions or journalists see entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs can change very quickly because entrepreneurs are by definition people who are sort of programmed to change and be efficient when they're faced with challenges. So I think all they need is to get a certain number of positive signals and support to operate this change. Two ways we can support entrepreneurs. We can help them work more on the long term and define a long term vision. We need to develop tax incentives for long term investment. We need to develop tax incentive for dividends paid to people who've owned their stocks for 10 years so that individual money can be invested and in 10 years you get tax rebate for your profit. This will help entrepreneurs to think on the long term and not just on the short term. The second thing we could uh, work on, and that's the law, we should have a law about local voluntary work in companies. Um, for instance, if a staff says they want to 
dedicate part of their time at local level in the city where the company is based, maybe the business manager could allow his staff to work for a local cause and be exonerated from labor taxes, for instance. Uh, another example creation of a territorial fund. It exists in other countries like India. I discovered the miracle of this law that was passed in 2014. And this local territorial fund makes it mandatory for a company to invest 2% of their net profit before tax locally. If they don't do that and they consider that the, the government is in a better position to invest, they can give the money to the government. This fund, this reserve, allows financing local actions. The impact is incredible because when you are a shop owner in a small city, all of a sudden you realize that you have 30,000 euros that you can spend on a social action each year, that you have to spend on social action each year. And that's how you can mobilize on supporting disabled people, financing the kindergarten, uh, contributing to education and helping teachers. And that's transforming. And that's something we could work on. Of course, it takes a law that's difficult. But I think there is a large number of us who are convinced. And I think we can be convincing, especially with a totally new parliament probably looking for innovative ideas. So, in summary, we should work on the legal framework, work on tax incentives, and we should change the mindset of investors so that long term becomes the standard and not so that they stop thinking just about short term. And what was striking in what you said is, the, is to, be, to be very much linked to your community, to your territory, to where you live. And this is the experience that Ashoka has uh, developed over the last few years with many great corporations. We made them understand that taking care of the ecosystem means taking care of their future. Danone, for instance, has understood that, that if its ecosystem was not doing fine, it would have problems in the future. So that means taking care of all your stakeholders, your employees, obviously, your shareholders, obviously, but also your suppliers, your local community, etc., etc. So we have six months to work on this, and I guess this debate has generated many frustrations, so we'll get back to you with the result of our...